This is Voices of Upstream. We're coming to you from the food building in Northeast Minneapolis. Uh, and excited Sunday. to learn a little bit about how you go upstream, how you love Minnesota, and how you take care of it. Um, so tell me a little bit about the origin of the food building. How did this come to be? Well, the origin of the food building, I suppose, goes back uh, many, many years. And I suppose the turning point would have been a conversation that I had with Mike Phillips. And Mike was uh, uh, working with us in the pubs and just a discussion, probably a couple of beers involved, maybe some Irish whiskey, uh, around uh, the idea that these great raw ingredients from Minnesota were going to other states, getting value-added, processed, and then coming back to Minnesota. And so from an environmental standpoint, it didn't seem to make sense. And from an economic standpoint, it didn't seem to make sense. And so that was the genesis of the idea of food building, that we could actually have artisan or uh, craft food production using these great ingredients from Minnesota here in uh, the city, where you would have access to uh, you know, the community, where they could come and find out about it, Etc. So that was where it kind of started. And your tagline is farm near, made here. Farm near, made here. And so tell us about how you work with growers and producers and farmers. What's the relationship between food building and them? Well, the relationship is really to find uh, farmers that have a, uh, a similar value system. In other words, that they are, uh, I mean, I'll give the example of uh, one of our, because <laughs> I just had, happened to spend a couple, of day, uh, couple of hours with them, Luke Peterson. Luke farms about 500 acres out in western Minnesota. And Luke, uh, even in the last year, has gotten regenerative certification. And so he is, uh, he is the model, <laughs> uh, for sure, of what we do. And it's also a very close relationship there, because he's also uh, growing the Kearns uh, grain developed by a perennial uh, wheat developed by the University of Minnesota. Uh, and as a perennial, it obviously has a lot of great values in terms of deep roots, less water, soil erosion. Uh, um, very supportive in terms of uh, limiting soil erosion. So things like that, that where these farmers are really, their practices, well, their values and then their practices are so supportive of the land one, the quality of the ingredients that they're growing. Like, you know, our, uh, our milk farm uh, feeds the cows year-round, grass year-round. So it's grass-fed year-round. I believe there's only about a half a dozen farms in Minnesota that do that. And that milk, uh, again, is so like everything that we're doing here, or trying to do here, because there are plenty of problem, challenges, I should say, uh, is how do you take things back to how things were done before industrialization? so that you're keeping not alone the nutrient values, but also the flavor values uh, intact. And it is the minimal processing. Uh, fermentation is also a theme in the building. So we're really talking about the health issues, but you also still have to have great flavor. Yeah, so how does that show up? Um, tell us a little bit about the foods you offer here. And what are the distinctive traits of those foods? Well, it's ever-changing. <laughs> uh, on the cheese, with Alamar cheese, um, what we're doing is uh, milk from grass-fed cows. We do French-style soft cheeses. Uh, we just won second-best brie in America uh, for one of our cheeses. Uh, then with Bakersfield flour and bread, we have about uh, half a dozen farms that we work with and uh, they're either organic or practicing organic. Uh, and you know, being just organic can be challenging for some of the, the farms, because they're smaller and it does take a lot of uh, time and some expertise, but uh, they are practicing if they're not already organic. What we're doing in Bakersfield, though, is we're stone milling the grain. And stone milling makes a massive difference to the quality of the flour, both from a nutrient standpoint and also from a flavor standpoint. And so, you know, we're blessed to have most of the top pastry chefs in towns and, and so would buy the flour from us. Many of the great uh, pizza places in town buy from us as well the flour. Uh, what the stone milling does is leave a much higher percentage of the brand, the germ, and the endosperm intact. And so again, from a health standpoint, but also a flavor. Uh, the breads are all naturally uh, leavened. You know, the, the, our, the, the co-ops are great supporters of ours across the board, and uh, some of the other great retailers in town as well. 
Then with red table meats, we're now transitioning that uh, from it was just uh, uh, salumi, which is the overarching name for salamis, whole muscle cures, have all pork, mm -hmm. uh, hogs from Minnesota. And uh, we're now transitioning that to Lowry Hill uh, Provisions. Uh, and Eric there, uh, Eric Sather is uh, their leader and he's partnering with us and we're going to do whole animal butchery. So we're doing across the board, so beef, uh, lamb, goat, uh, chicken, and that will really be coming on stream here probably by the end of March, beginning of April. But not losing the salamis, I hope. Not losing the oh, salamis. We'll have salamis in there as well. And then we have Tres Leche, which is our botanical fermentation. Marco and his team in there are doing uh, really interesting, innovative, and exciting pro uh, uh, projects. The one product we have for sale here is the kombucha, uh, the Tres Leche kombucha. And so everything from you know, uh, uh, Mike, fellows, Mike will be transitioning out with Red Table, but you know, we owe him a great debt of, uh, uh, of gratitude for his pursuit and his sparking a fire uh, all those years ago, nine, ten years ago now, I guess. Uh, and then uh, now Eric taking over with the Lowry Hill Provisions and partnering with us uh, to Charlotte, who's an amazing cheese maker in with Alamar. Uh, Patrick, who is our head baker and miller in Bakersfield and the work that he does. Um, Kieran's Kitchen will trans, uh, that will transform into food building, market cafe and event center. Mainly I wanted to really drive the message that that is really the factory shop. This is where you get to come as a marketplace or as a cafe to experience mm -hmm. um, uh, the products in the building, whether you happen to uh, consume them here on the building, in the building, or you take them to go home and you use them as ingredients or as a prepared meal. But again, it's about driving that message of the why behind why we're doing and who are the people behind it as well. And that's also why we have it as an event center. Uh, have an event center where you can look into the building, people can come here, it can be part of their experience. Whether it is a wedding, whether it's a corporate event, event, uh, whatever it have, a family event, reunions, you name it, uh, where people can come, they can have their event, but they can have it in a unique environment uh, where, uh, again, there are other things going on, but they also get to consume the products that are made in the building. And so um, you're a man with vision. That's one of the things that people <laughs> talk about yeah. in the food scene in the Twin Cities. What do you hope the overall food scene in the Twin Cities learns from food building and this sort of farm to, farm to plate with little processing as possible? What do you hope that we take out of that and how does that impact the care for Minnesota yeah, that we have? I, I think really the overall goal would be in our own small way, I and mean, we are small businesses, but that we can change somehow the culture. <coughs> Excuse me. That we could change the culture about how people think about their food when they get maybe more of a direct connection to farmers, to makers. They get to taste the product. Now, you know, we're hoping to bring a lot of that back post COVID. Well, it's not post COVID, of course, because it'll probably be with us. But now that people are gathering again mm -hmm. and getting out and about, we're looking for this spring and summer to hold events here with our farmers, with our makers, where there can be education, but it's education uh, delivered through the Trojan horse of tasting and, and consuming the products that are made in the building and like minded makers that are out in our area as well. And so, can you do something to connect? Uh, and have collaboration with the farmers and the other makers in our market that have similar values. You know, we have three school tours coming in here in the next uh, six weeks. Uh, that's another great opportunity because they are the next generation, obviously, uh, and the next consumers out there. And can you plant seeds there so the connections are made and the education continues? But doing it in a kind of a, also in a you know, a very, uh, uh, I don't know what the word, it's not fun, uh, but in an engaging and uh, kind of, again, I'm trying, I'm struggling for that word, but uh, yeah. because you don't want to say entertaining <clears throat> or food, because there's a lot of that out there, but in a way that, you know, a thoughtful way, I guess. Yeah, great. So a big part of um, being upstream is not just caring for a but showing our love for it as well. 
you're an adopted Minnesotan. You've moved yeah. here and stayed here by choice despite all the snow. What is it about Minnesota that you love? Especially what is it about the outdoors in Minnesota that you love? Well, you know, big fans of uh, certainly the North Shore, um, big fans of, uh, you know, the Boundary Waters, uh, you know, the lakes right here in the city. And uh, I think the, uh, you know, I grew up in a farm community in the west of Ireland, but I've actually lived in Minnesota longer than I lived anywhere in my life. So I've been here, I'll be here 36 years this year. And so I think, you know, just the, uh, uh, it's the accessibility of, of the outdoors. It is the um, uh, the variety. You know, the, you know, you're on Lake Superior up on the North Shore. I mean, it's like being on the Atlantic, <laughs> which I grew up about thirty miles from uh, as a kid. But then the hiking uh, is fantastic. Uh, you know, I never really got into the skiing and the skating because I was too bloody old <laughs> by the time I got here. But the hiking, uh, the running, uh, you know, jumping into uh, into Superior, there's a good shock to the system. Uh, right. But so it's it's embracing all of that, I think. But even you know the drive to get up to the North Shore, it's fantastic. So the Scandinavians have the idea of higa, which is like being comfortable, comfortable in winter. Comfortable, yeah. And the Ojibwe, it's termed baboon, which is like the the season to share stories. Is there a similar sentiment in the Irish culture? Uh, how we sort of huddle together in the coldest parts and the darkest parts of the year? Yeah, well, it's called the public house, the pub, the pub. <laughs> where you're looking out, <laughs> where you're looking out the window at the at the rain and the weather. I mean, obviously, it's not always raining in Ireland, uh, and the weather patterns have changed over there certainly since I was a kid. Uh, but yeah, I just watched the uh, uh, the uh, the Banshees Venezuelan with uh, <laughs> with uh, Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson and Barry Keown and that minute. Fantastic, and Kerry Condon in it as well. Great lineup. There was no redeeming quality to it, unfortunately, but I did love it. Well, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the spirit. I yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Martin McDonough's uh, work as well. All of his plays, and, uh, and so I think it is really more about how people connect at home. Uh, Irish people in general are very friendly, they're very open, they're curious about things. And so it's the combination of, I don't know that, that probably somebody has, has what that word that would collect the literary side with the wildness, uh, but also then connected somehow with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the hospitality, the, the curiosity, how they like to, we like to connect with people. Well, and that's certainly something you've done in your career, is give us places to do that. Well, Kieran, as a parent of two gingers, two redheads, uh, appreciate the work you do here to, <laughs> to show us the love of Minnesota and the care for Minnesota. Thanks for living upstream. Eddie, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, best wishes with the great work that you guys are doing with Upstream and trying to change the culture out there also in a uh, well, pretty much in the same space. Thank you. Thank you.